Welcome, welcome, welcome to our ESU Happy Hour with Jean Kanakoji on her mother, Rusty Kanakoji, and the history of women's Olympic judo. Our sponsoring branch today is the New York branch of the English Speaking Union. And if you or any other members of your branch have ideas for an ESU Happy Hour, please be sure to fill out the survey that will appear at the end of our program today. A couple of technical announcements before we begin. There will be a Q&A at the end of the presentation. Please be sure to use the Q&A and chat module buttons at the bottom of your screen to participate by typing in your questions. And please note that you can submit your question at any time during the presentation, but we will get to them in the order received at the end during the dedicated Q&A session. In addition, we will be raffling off two copies of Get Up and Fight, the memoir of Raina Rusty Kanakoji. So be sure to stay until the end of the presentation in order to possibly win a copy. Uh, in addition, I'd like to recognize the branches with the most registrations for this happy hour. They include our Central Florida branch, the New Orleans branch, and the Seattle branch. So congratulations to the three of them. Uh, now, I'd like to introduce uh, former ESU chairman, Dr. Paul Beresford Hill. Dr. Paul. Thank you very much indeed, Josh. Great to be here and great to uh, be a part of a program this afternoon that is going to talk about and share with you the life experiences of a woman uh, that I knew many years ago when I became headmaster of the Anglo-American School in New York uh, a, long, a long, long time ago. Rusty Kenakogi, what on earth could a former Coney Island gang leader who spent her adult years throwing around men bigger and stronger than she is, like 10 pins in the bowling alley, what could she have in common with a rather wimpy quintessential Englishman in New York? Well, the answer actually is quite simple. The thing that brought us together was that we belonged to a very unique and very exclusive international club. No, we were not affiliated with the group of eight and neither had we much time for the World Trade Organization. No, our common belief was the power of education to change young people for the better. Rusty Kanakogi did it her way through the self-discipline of judo, through encounters steeped in ritual, and history, stressing a fundamental respect for others. I and my teachers, we did it our way. We did our part in the classroom. And in a strange way, we were empowered by a dimension of our school sports program that didn't just focus on ruthless competition and the be all and end all of winning, but which was all about taming the inner person all about self-control and all about respect for your opponent. As international educators, we believed in the process of positive change, yet we were sufficiently aware of the fact that the world is a conflicted and at times a dangerous and angry place. Rusty held fast to a deep belief in the innate capacity for good at the center of the young people who are entrusted to our care as educators. She understood that a corrupted world would try to have its way with them, but she also knew that there were antidotes to counter that corruption and that knowledge of and respect for both self and others was a good start. She didn't have to find more inspiration than her own life. I'm delighted that Rusty's daughter Jean Kanakogi is going to be speaking to us this afternoon about her mother. She's just completed a biography of her mother. I've read it and it is absolutely a brilliant, amusing, funny. It's got everything in it. It's got sorrow, it's got happiness, it's got joy, but above all, it has spirit and soul. This woman put judo into the worldwide Olympics. And it wasn't an easy struggle for, Rus for Rusty Kanakogi, but she did it. And we maybe will find out why and how. Jean. 
Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining me for Happy Hour. Well, first, before we get to any presentation, thank you, Ambassador Hill, for that amazing introduction and for your lifelong friendship with my mother. Uh, my, my father still, he cherishes your friendship and uh, you and Kathy's friendship immensely. So thank you. Uh, it, it's so surreal for me to be introduced by a dear friend of my mother's to then tell the story about my mother. Before we get into the story, I want everybody to grab their cocktail if they have it. I have my sake mojito. So uh, it's, it's a little bit light because I still have to work out after this presentation, but I have the sake mojito. Enjoy, take sips, and sit back and listen. I'm going to share screen right now and let's get into this presentation. Rusty Kanakogi, the mother of women's judo. So I have a, a screen up about the Tokyo 2020, oops, 2021 Olympic Games. And that picture of the 2020 to 2021 really embodies resilience. And that's a lot what Rusty was about. She was resilient, she never gave up. And this is a story of how an ordinary person changed the world and the lives for so many. Let me give you a quick guide to what judo is. Judo is an Olympic martial art where competitors known as judokas face opponents in single combat in a tournament of elimination. The founder of modern judo, Jigoro Kano, had a philosophy of maximum efficiency, minimum effort. This is the key to the sport of judo. Judokas must wear a special jacket, trousers and belt. The judogi. In competition, players wear white or blue. Judogi is essential to the strategies and the tactics of the sport. Gripping up is critical. The person who dominates the gripping of the jacket will normally be in the best position to dominate the fight. So, how do you play and how do you win? Each fight is up to five minutes long for men, four for women. Opponents begin the fight with a bow. This is fundamental to the principles of judo. The referee then signals the start of play and the contest begins. The highest score is an ippon. This is the ultimate score because it wins the contest outright and finishes the fight. There are four ways to score it on. The first one is to throw your opponent flat on their back with force. And this can be done using a variety of throws from many different directions. Sometimes as a direct attack and sometimes countering an opponent's attack. Ippon can also be awarded during groundwork. If you hold your opponent on their back for 20 seconds by controlling the upper part of their body, then Ippon is awarded and the contest is finished. Two other ways to win by Ippon are to gain a submission, either by arm locking or strangling your opponent. If your opponent taps out, Ippon is awarded and the contest is finished. Was there so I'm gonna cut it right there on the Epon because that's gonna come into play a little bit later on as I talk about Rusty and how she got women's judo into the Olympics. You see these faces of, from all around the world. These women would not be able to display these emotions, these raw, uncontained emotions, had it not been for the sacrifices and the perseverance of Rusty. She had this indomitable spirit that would not accept the word no into her vocabulary. Well, of course, unless I wanted a second scoop of ice cream, but that's neither here nor there. Let's get this started.
mentions, I wrote a book called Get Up and Fight because I heard that constantly growing up. But I'll tell you a little bit about Rusty growing up first. She grew up in Coney Island, Brooklyn, New York. As you can see by the photos, if you could pick her out of the lineup on your screen, she was the big one. That was little baby Rusty. And I don't know what contraption she was trying to ride on the grass uh, as a child, but she was born in 1935. So she grew up in the 40s and 50s in Coney Island. Uh, Coney Island is a very unique place because it was residential, but there were arcades and uh, there was a lot of chaos, constant chaos. Her tumultuous childhood was because her parents were always fighting. Her father was pretty much either absentee or located in a local pub and really drinking and gambling his wages away. Her mother, my grandmother, was working in a candy factory and she suffered injury to her hand. Subsequently, she took painkillers and she had to keep taking those painkillers just to provide some money for the household. So Rusty had to fend for herself and she was on the boardwalk and, and taken in by a family that was sadly at the time called People from the Freak Show. So her babysitters were Milo the Mule Faced Boy and the Pinhead Sisters. Well, these people took her in as their own family. They treated her uh, kindly. And that's where she started developing her character that you don't judge a book by the cover. You don't judge people by other people making fun of them. You judge them how they make you feel, how they treat you, how they treat others. So she started developing her own character. It wasn't a character that she learned in a book or somebody told her. This is what she started feeling it and believing. And why this is important and adds to her resilience is because she made up her own mind and she knew right from wrong and, she, and, and in making some decisions. Some she kind of still, even if she knew right from wrong, she leaned a little towards the wrong. And in the book, uh, it, it's highlighted that at the time she was part of, as she grew up, part of a street gang in Coney Island in Brooklyn. And it was a woman's gang, not like we know gangs today, but it was one of those where you put on your leather jacket and your pedal pushers and you go and you fight in the schoolyard. So that's the type of gang that she led. Nonetheless, uh, she was a rough and tumble, tomboyish kind of woman. And growing up in Coney Island, if you could take a look uh, at the old car in the back, I mean, just these historic pictures really paint a picture of who Rusty was. She was the big girl out of all the little girls. She was the Jewish girl in a predominantly Italian neighborhood. So she was always riding uphill against the green. As she was growing up, she made some poor choices. And sadly, one of the poor choices she made at the time was she got married a little bit young. And she married somebody just like her father who drank too much and was, was inattentive. So in order to try to save the marriage, she went to Al-Anon while she believed he was going to AA, but the, I think the name of the local bar was AA in his case. But while she was at Al-Anon, she met a friend and Rusty liked to work out. She was very physical. So she asked him, well, hey, what do you do to work out? You look strong. And he said, well, I lift weights and I do judo. And, and this is in the early 1950s. And she's like, well, what is judo? And he explained that this is a Japanese martial art. Well, she, she didn't take too kindly of that. She said, well, didn't we just have a war? Aren't we at, at odds with Japan? So he picked her up on his hip with a judo throw. Like she was a lightweight, like she was a piece of paper. And she said, wow, I forgive Japan for everything. I need to learn this sport. So she followed him. She said, I, I need to learn judo. And she followed him to his class at the Prospect Park YMCA in Brooklyn. Well, the funny thing is the YMCA is the Young Men's Christian Association, and she's some Jewish girl from Coney Island. So right there, two strikes against her walking in. And the third strike was that she's a woman and no women were allowed in the judo class. So she kept on insisting and insisting and showing up. Finally, they said, okay, fine. You want to learn judo, you'll learn judo on one day. And then you're going to have to turn around and teach judo the next day. So this YMCA was progressive. They said, wow, let's get a woman teaching women's judo. This is fantastic. She made so many friends in that class and the camaraderie built. In 1959, they went to a judo tournament at the YMCA in Utica, New York as a state championship. She brought her judo gi, as you can see, that's what we call a judo gi. And just to warm up with her, uh, with her 
teammates because she knew she wasn't going to compete. She heard a yell from across the map and she looked over and it was one of her teammates and he got injured. So her coach came up to her and said, Rusty, I'm putting you in in his place, but don't call attention to yourself. Just pull a draw. Don't do anything outside to, to draw attention. So she runs to the bathroom and she puts on the rest of her judo gi, takes an ace bandage and wraps her chest to disguise herself as a man to ensure that she didn't stand out looking like a woman. She was very tall and, and athletic, so people didn't really know any better. She did a grip, she did grip fighting. Now earlier, if you see in the video, they had to grab a grip. When I did this, this in person, I actually had everybody do a grip. So while you're sitting at your computer, I want you to think about grabbing. So you grab the judo gi at the lapel, and then you grab by the sleeve. And the one who has the strongest grip and the most controlling grip is the one who's going to be able to maneuver the other person. So again, grab the lapel, grab the sleeve, and just imagine moving that person in front of you. And that's a grip. Now, do you think when you bow to your opponent, your opponent says, hey, take your grip, I'll get my grip. No, it becomes a fight. And this is where it only almost turned into a fist fight because this man was, and Rusty was the only person standing in the way because this was a gold medal match. This was going to determine which team takes home the gold medal. Rusty got her grip. The other guy got his grip. It was a brawl. Rusty came in on a judo technique. And earlier we talked about the upon. It was described as a full point. Well, Rusty committed herself on a judo technique. And as you saw those bodies fly through the air in the earlier video, well, Rusty came in and threw him for that upon, that full point. And she just couldn't believe that she won. She was so excited. She said, oh, I won, I won. And then afterwards, it dawned on her that she shouldn't have called attention to herself and said, oh boy, now what? I won. Well, they all got awarded their medal. And Rusty was so proud. She looked at that medal and thought, wow, this is my medal. I won this. I earned it. And instead of getting a citation for fighting, she actually got a medal. So that was huge for her. She was proudly wearing that medal. Her team got the first place trophy. And as she was walking out, the tournament director approached her. I'm recording the audio book for this book, Get Up and Fight. So I am going to play you one of my raw audio files of this scene of the tournament director approaching Rusty. Are you a girl? He asked in a low tone, out of earshot of the others. I know you're a girl. Then he added, in a snide, guttural, condescending tone that it was illegal for me to compete because women were not allowed to compete. My first thought was this jerk didn't even give me the recognition for being a woman and referred to me simply as a girl. In my head, I mimicked his same snide tone and I asked him if he were a cow because his question was so outlandish. In reality, I kept my mouth shut. Judo had taught me to choose my battles. My heart was racing. I felt tears welling up in my eyes. Not from sadness, but from boiled anger. But I kept listening. I held in those tears. No one could think I was soft. Not even now. He told me if I accepted the first place medal, my team would be disqualified and would have to forfeit their win and their trophy we had rightfully earned. I was shaking inside. My heart dropped to the floor. My breathing was labored, but I showed nothing to him. He and his rule makers did not deserve any emotion from me. This was all done quietly. No other tournament officials knew about it, but I told Coach Evoy. He exclaimed that the team would all give their medals back, but I insisted that that would make the situation even worse because these medals were all won fair and square. I went back to the tournament director and agreed, in as casual a way as I could muster. I would not accept the medal, my medal, my very first win. I handed him my cherished medal. At that moment, I felt like I did everything wrong just by being a female. I was heartbroken. As I uttered the words of declination, I realized 
that this moment would be one of those pivotal occasions, not just in my life, but in the lives of women in judo and other sports around the world. No woman shall ever suffer such an indignity ever again, I told myself. I will make sure of it. I was going to change judo history. Well, Rusty decided at that point, that was her turning point. That was her purpose. Are you a girl? Well, that was her purpose. She had to do something. And she was, Rusty was one of those types of people that was never said someone should do something because the world, she said, was full of shoulds. How about this? I will do something. I don't know what it is, but I will do something. So what did she do? She hopped a flight to Japan. Now, in 1962, it's not that easy to just hop a flight to Japan. Uh, her students chipped in and bought her luggage. They chipped in and bought her a ticket because she wanted to go to Japan where judo was born, where it came from, and really study the philosophies and the sport in its raw form to bring it back to the United States and know that she can make some changes. So she went to train at the Kodokan. The Kodokan is where judo started, where the, uh, Professor Jigoro Kano started judo. When she got to the Kodokan, they put her on the women's side. So as you can see, she was a little bit taller than some of the women it, in the Kodokan. And it was great because when she was on the women's side, she learned what they call kata, which was the form practice. It was the non-combative side of judo. But Rusty was hungry. She wanted more. She wanted the combative side. And again, the way she persisted, they let her into the men's side of the dojo or the judo school in the Kodokan. It was the men's side. She was the first woman to ever go in the men's side because this is where she embodied that mantra, fall down seven, get up eight, because boy, did they throw her. They threw her all over the place and she kept on getting up and she was gaining such respect. She made so many friends at the Kodokan. Uh, she made incredible friends and learned so much judo. She trained with 1964 Olympians. And she, there was, there was some really good friends she made. And one particular friend, he went home during a break at the Kodokan. And his father asked him, hey, have you seen that woman training at the Kodokan, the American, the, the redheaded lady? And he said, yeah, yeah, she's my friend. He told him, you know, you should marry that lady she'll give you big, strong babies. Well, I call that man dad. So here's the affectionate photo of my parents doing judo. He came back, here's the love story of this. In 19, after she left 1962, in 1964, he returned, he had a place, he can be chosen to go anywhere in the world to teach judo, but he chose the United States. Specifically, he chose New York because he wanted to find Rusty. He wanted to find Rusty because there was some very special connection. Uh, as going through Rusty's papers, it was very moving for me. I found a love letter he wrote and it was just, it was amazing. So there's the first big strong baby, that would be me. Uh, he came back and in 1964, they married. It was just absolutely beautiful to see two cultures coming together and, and just reading the history of it and listening to my dad tell me the stories and my mom telling me the stories. So not only did he bring judo to the United States, he brought, he protected us from Samsonite luggage. Check it out. Samsonite versus Kano Koji. Yeah! Samsonite makes over 400 styles of tough bags. Sam Could you imagine growing up in that household with my father kicking and punching luggage all over the place and uh, my mother fighting for women's rights, fighting for judo? But, you know, she also had this affection for Disney World. We would go to Disney World as a family every year. 
she said she loved Mickey and Minnie, and uh, she always looked at Donald Duck a little crooked. She said, I don't know, that duck is up to something. But she took us to Disney all the time uh, because that was her happy place. She never had that. So she tried to give us a regular life. She tried to be a mother, but also a, a pioneer, a trailblazer. My father, an actor, a judo instructor, uh, just a crazy family from Brooklyn. One of the other role, one of the role models that Rusty had in her life was her Aunt Lee, Lee Krasner Pollock. I bet some of you have heard of, of Lee Krasner Pollock, wife of Jackson Pollock, and an amazing abstract artist in her own right. Lee showed my mom what it was to be strong, what it was to stand up against the grain. So even though Aunt Lee was an artist, she still has something to do with getting women's judo in the Olympics because she helped give my mother the courage to really stand up against whatever it is that you have to stand up against to get up and fight and to make sure that justice is served. And at this point, the justice was, was equality for women in sports. So Rusty used to visit Aunt Lee and have these really long talks all the time. They made a movie about Jackson Pollock and Aunt Lee. So Marcia Gay Harden played Lee Krasner Pollock, and it was, she did a phenomenal job. Matter of fact, she won the Oscar. One of the really cool things about that is that Marcia stayed at my parents' house and wore Lee's clothing, and my mom really coached her into that role of how to be Aunt Lee. I'm going to let Marcia tell you a couple of words about her experience with Rusty. One of the last chapters of Rusty's life, she would become confidant and advisor to Hollywood stars. Uh, Rusty invited me to come out to meet her so we could talk about Lee Krasner. And uh, if I was there, I would tell you this story, so I'll tell you the story from here in Canada. I came into the driveway, and I actually had thought Rusty, because I'd heard her voice, and I didn't know it was her niece, it was a relative, I was told. I thought it was a guy, um, because Rusty had that deep voice. And I came into the driveway and I saw Rusty and Kano, and they invited me inside, and Rusty immediately uh, invited me to lie down on the bed where Lee Krasna had, had slept if I wanted to, or I could uh, go through the closet where I might find a Moo Moo, a Lee Krasna Moo Moo, and I could wear it if I wanted to. And we sat down at the table and had some tea, and Kano nodding the whole time. And then she said, uh, Marsha, if you want to play Lee Krasna, you have to start screaming from the minute you walk through the door to the minute you leave. Then she smiled. She said, actually, if you want to play Lee Krasna, Lee was strongly matter of fact, strongly matter of fact. And I kept that with me because I didn't really know what that meant. I, I'm not strongly matter of fact. I'm, you know, every emotion possible is on my sleeve. So I took it back to Ed and Ed said, strongly matter of fact. I like that, yeah. So he always would use that word, strongly matter of fact, when he was directing me as Lee Krasner. And um, I actually think that those words, uh, Gene, helped Pollock a little bit when we, when we were released, helped us to get some notice. Um, I just uh, want to say what a great lady your mom was and your wife was, Kano, and how she, in a heartbeat, opened herself up to the film, to me, and uh, became a friend over time. And she never stopped talking about Eugene, how proud she was of you, and how much she loved you, Kano. And for this great woman who had done great things for women everywhere, and judo, and had a title, and reclaimed a title recently, um, I just feel like she's still here because someone of that size, in every way, that heart, that brain, those guts, that voice, um, they, they don't disappear in the, the Golden Gates. She's here and her, her legend lives on long after her. So I'm really grateful that she was my friend. That video gets me each time. Uh, Rusty did fight for equality. She teamed up with Billie Jean King and Gina Davis and the Women's Sports Foundation because she believed uh, for equality for women in sports that they should have the same, no more, no less, but equality. She went up to Capitol Hill, she lobbied, she met different presidents, and she really was advocating for equality, nothing for her. Rusty's mission was bigger than her. It was a bigger picture. But you know, she was my coach 
she was my sensei. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about myself after, but she was not only my coach and my sensei, she was the coach and sensei for so many. We had a dojo, our school. It was in the middle of Flatbush Avenue in Brooklyn. And in one of the roughest areas, you could even see the sign is spelled wrong. People were so scared. Nobody wanted to tell her that it was spelled incorrectly, graffiti all over the place. But she did, she, she and my dad wanted that dojo in the middle of Brooklyn so that everybody can have the opportunity to practice judo. It didn't, judo doesn't know color, orientation, race. It, it knows one thing, we're all one big family. So diversity and inclusion in, existed in my world before I even knew those words. That's what judo is, once for one family. And we had visitors from all around the world. Pictured here is two-time Olympic gold medalist, Ingrid Bergman's from Belgium. She was part of our family. She was like family. We have a woman there from the Italian judo team. We have an Olympian down in the front center from the 1988 Olympic Games who walked into the stadium with my mom. I mean, we had people from all over the world. The Japanese Olympic Committee president, Mr. Yamashita, standing there with my father in our little dojo in Brooklyn. Radomir Kovacevic, originally from Yugoslavia, Olympian, Olympic medalist just hanging out in Brooklyn in our little humble dojo. So I'll tell you, people would ask Rusty, well, where do you come up? Where, where's this, this fight inside of you? Where do you get it from? And she says she gets it from her Brooklyn attitude. I'm going to introduce you to some videos of Rusty. And here's one of her explaining what her Brooklyn attitude is. The Brooklyn attitude, as far as I'm concerned, is first knowing what you're doing being right and following through and never stop following through on what you believe in. And um, if you have to defend it physically, verbally, spiritually, whatever way you have to defend it is, is if you, Brooklyn people are always ready to pay the price for what they believe in. And um, it's being upfront and following through and not taking any crap from anybody. Well, those were words I lived by. So here's the first part of not taking crap from anybody. Rusty wanted women's judo in the Olympics. And she went to, at that time, the USA Judo and all of the international forum. And it was predominantly run by naysayers, misogynists, and people that didn't believe that women's judo should be an Olympic sport. Men's judo was included in 1964. So here we are in 1980 or before 1980, and she wanted women's judo in the Olympics, in the 1980 Olympics. Uh, thank goodness it wasn't because we didn't go to Moscow, but she thought women's judo needed that opportunity. And they said, no. Well, of course, no, not being in that vocabulary. She said, well, what do I have to do to get women's judo in the Olympics? And they said, well, Rusty, you need to have a world championship. You've not had a world championship. There have not been any women's world championships. And she said, fine, I will hold a world championship. And almost like a schoolyard challenge. They said, oh yeah, where are you gonna do that, Rusty? And she just stood there firmly, shoulders up, head up. She said, I'll have that at Madison Square Garden. And she described that the words coming out of her mouth, she actually watched them come out of her mouth and knowing she could not pull them back. Well, she walked out of there all proud. I'm going to have a world championship at Madison Square Garden. So that night she comes to our judo school and we line up and, and the announcements are made who got promoted, and who did well in school and uh, just housekeeping rules. And by the way, we're having a world championship at Madison Square Garden. So my father looks at her and says, wait a minute, we have like $140 in the bank. How is this going to happen? And she said, everybody here will help. We're going to make it happen. Women's judo needs to be in the Olympics. Well, this was a force to be reckoned with. And this was in 1979, putting this together. She just got the approval pretty much uh, less than a year prior. And planning a world championships, you need a lot of time to get and over 125 countries. And, or I'm sorry, you need 25 countries and 100, 100 something competitors. It was just insane to get all of this together and figure out how to rent Madison Square Garden. Well, she decided, that's it, I'm doing it. And there was absolutely no stopping her. One of the things she needed for this first Women's World Championships was a logo. And Rusty was all about authenticity. So if you see the picture of the two women throwing each other, Mindy Douglas and Leslie Conti, 
they're actually students of Rusty that threw each other thousands of times, or I'm sorry, hundreds of times, nearly a thousand times to get the right throw. Her photographer, Peter Porazio, another student and a person that was her right hand and Rusty, or actually her left hand and Rusty was a lefty to put together the first woman's world championship. He took the photograph and they made that into the logo. The Japanese writing says judo and the circle uh, appears to be the world because that's what judo is, it's around the world. So she needed money for this. She, got, she did fundraising and she contacted the International Judo Federation president at the time, Dr. Shigeyoshi Matsumai. Now you can see this is the picture of him in New York at the first Women's World Championship, really impressed by what Rusty did. Dr. Matsumai, by the way, he was the electrical engineer and the inventor of the loaded cable carrier system in Japan and also the founder of Tokai University. And he believed in unity and education, just like Dr. Beersford Hill. He, and just like Dr. Beersford Hill, he believed in Rusty. So he came through with the rest of the money to help keep the doors open at the Mad at Madison Square Garden. Now, fast forward a few years later, Rusty and Dr. Matsumai, again, on board together to get women's judo into the Olympics now, believed that Japan needed an international tournament on their home, home turf so that Japanese women can get more international experience. So what he did is he decided with Rusty and uh, RKB Minichi Television to get the 1983 first Fukuoka Women's Judo Championship as an international tournament in Japan. I'll show you how beautiful this opening ceremonies was. ハイカイ Are you starting to see a Where's Waldo kind of theme? Uh, I don't know if you're able to pick me up out of that last lineup, but uh, it's almost like a Where's Waldo. Now, if you look at this picture again, here's the Where's Waldo. You can see me all the way in the back. Uh, Rusty decided that since we're, she's being told no, they had two world championships and the first Fukuoka championships. Now the discrimination suit starts. She wanted women's judo in the 1984 Olympics on our home soil in Los Angeles, and she was declined. She was told no. So she initiated a lawsuit against the International Olympic Committee. She teamed up with the American Civil Liberties Union and uh, Foundation, and they helped Rusty initiate this lawsuit of discrimination against the International Olympic Committee. And one of the things I want to highlight here is the one of the signatures that you can see Jeremy Glick he not only supported women's judo he was a friend of Rusty's and he was on the flight that went down in Shanksville and he was the one that said let's roll and that's the type of hero that supported women's judo in 1984 Rusty went to the Los Angeles games she wanted to put an injunction on the Olympics she wanted to stop the Olympics because of discrimination. She sued the Olymp International Olympic Committee and she won. They were found guilty of discrimination. She said, that's it. We have to be in. We have to be in those 88 games. Here's a day in the life of Rusty. Let her tell you what, what it's all about. I've sent several letters to Ted Turner with no response, trying to find out why women's judo was not included in the Goodwill Games. My name is Rusty Kanakogi from Brooklyn, New York. My schedule uh, starts uh, usually 7 o'clock in the morning unless I receive an international call and then can start at 5.30, answer the phones, get some letters out, teach. Sometimes I have three, four classes in different locations a day. There's always the next project. There's always something cooking. They don't pick on the strong. They pick on the weak. And each time, each time you giggle and each time you cheat on your exercise, that's another reason to get picked on. Do you understand? 
You don't have to look like Hercules to have strong shoulders. If your body's strong, your brain is strong, your will is strong, then maybe you can get along in life with everything. I teach judo self-defense at FIT. Got to teach the kids how to handle themselves. Get rid of the muggers. From here, stop! He's not going to bother anybody anymore. That's a heck of a mom to grow up with, I tell you. So here she is still there, still telling her no. The 84 Olympics has passed. She's got her eye on the 1988 Olympics. There is to get women's judo in. She said that they, they trained so hard. They deserve this. Women's judo around the world are hungry to get into the Olympics. Now, we always say, what would I tell my younger self? Well, let's listen to what my younger self thinks about her mother. Spring up. Without her mother, there would be no women's judo like it is today. If she sees something that she really wants, she'll go get it, no matter what's in her way. If there's a tree in her way, she'll move it. If there's people in her way, she'll move it. If there's a whole Olympic committee, United States or international, she'll move it just to get what she wants. And to get what she wants, here she is in victory. Rusty walked into that stadium in Seoul, Korea in 1988, proudly as the Olympic coach. She would have done anything. We'll get in the Olympic game. I mean, I probably would have sold my house, my children, <laughs> rented out my husband, whatever. I don't know if you heard the video, but she said she would have sold her house, rented out her husband, sold her children, whatever it took. Uh, I assure you that none of that occurred, but it still happened. She was so proud to be in Seoul, Korea. She won. This was her gold medal. This was Rusty's victory. She opened the doors so women all around the world can say, I want to be an Olympian in judo. And forever, this is her gift to women's judo. Why? To see a dream come true, to enable women's judo to... Uh become an Olympic sport because they deserve it. They, not only the United States, but all the women throughout the world that train their guts out for judo or any sport, they deserve it. They deserve it, that's why. Rusty was the 1996 Olympic, Olympic uh, in it, the 1996 Olympic referee in Atlanta. And in 2008, she was awarded the Japanese Order of the Rising Sun Gold Rays with Rosette for her contributions to the promotion of judo and the cultural exchange between the United States and Japan. 50 years later, after the YMCA took her medal away and, almost, and tried to strip her of her indignity, this is what happened. Uh, for after uh, 50 years, I'm getting a medal. Should have never been taken away from me. It was, but we're righting a wrong. So that's what counts. Uh, soon after uh, this whole negative experience, I didn't dwell on it. I just kept moving on. And that's the key. She didn't dwell on it. She just kept moving on. You have choices in life. When you're told no, when you're knocked down, when you're broken, do you lay there or do you get up and fight? And there is what Rusty is telling us. That's her message. She was awarded that medal in August of 2009. Three months later, she passed away in November of 2009. She succumbed to multiple myeloma. Rusty's ashes, some of her ashes are interred in the cemetery in Ankokoji in Kumamoto, Japan. This is a samurai cemetery. And what it says is Rusty Kanakogi, American samurai. That's what the Japanese people think of her. The Chuo High School judo team goes monthly and cleans her resting space. They bring her a fresh cup of coffee, too, because it wouldn't be normal if without Rusty with a, a fresh cup of coffee. They pray and they clean her gravesite. And this is how, again, the Japanese revere her and cherish what she has done for all of the sport of judo, not just women's judo. I'm going to play this because this was taken quite a while ago. And I would like to highlight the consistency of the message between Rusty and Dr. Paul, Paul Beersford Hill. Our commonality was a belief in the power of education to change young people for the better. 
Rusty did it her way through the self-discipline of judo, through encounters steeped in ritual and history, stressing a fundamental regard for others, which was all about taming the inner person, all about self-control, and all about respect for your opponent. This is amazing. This is, this is absolutely amazing. Thank you for that, Dr. Pierce for health. Rusty was an answer in Jeopardy in 2016. Uh, does anybody know the answer to this? Rusty Kanakozi threw herself into making this martial art a demonstration sport in Seoul. Anybody have any idea? I bet you do. That's right, judo. She was inducted into the International Judo Federation Hall of Fame in 2018. She was the first American woman, woman inducted into this Hall of Fame. This was a huge honor to be recognized because these are her peers. Some of these people may have been the original naysayers about women's judo. All the sacrifices I've made for women's judo have definitely been worth it. Welcome to Collegiate Nationals. Your friend on May number two, Rusty Conco. Judo? When you love something, when you are madly in love and never get out of love with it, to see it succeed, to see it proud, it's like going through life, paying the heaviest dues humanly possible, seeing a dream come true. In 2019, the corner of West 17th and Surf Avenue in Coney Island, Brooklyn, was officially co-named Rena Rusty Kanakogi Way. So Rusty did get her way, and it ultimately will stay there in front of the Coney Island Cyclone Stadium. Billie Jean King, who Rusty fought with, uh, alongside with, for Title IX, wrote the forward to our book. I'll let Billie tell you a little bit about this. Hi, everyone. Guess what I got today? I got uh, the Rusty Connie Kobe story that her daughter wrote, Jean. It is fantastic. I loved Rusty Kanakogi. She, we always have known her as the mother of women's judo. We would not have women's judo in the United States without Rusty Kanakogi. Her book was transported to Japan where this book was presented by Ms. Yamaguchi to the statue of the since past Dr. Shigeyoshi Matsumai, who was really a dear friend to Rusty. He brought the book to show him at the main Tokai University campus. 40 years later, last year, the International Judo Federation celebrated the 40th anniversary of the first Women's World Judo Championship. If this championship did not happen, women's judo would still be waiting to be added as an Olympic sport. And part of that celebration, they made a short video. I'd like to share that with you. Hi, everybody. I'm Frank Lieber, and welcome to Madison Square Garden's Felt Forum for a truly historic event in women's sports, the first World Women's Judo Championship. 27 nations on hand competing in eight different weight classifications, and working with me is Rusty Kanakogi herself, a former coach of the U.S. women's team and an organizer of this event, and I know this is a proud and happy moment for you. It certainly is, and we're very delighted to have you here cover our event, and it's a history being made, the beginning of the advanced movement towards the Olympics for women's judo.
Rusty showed me that the world was at my fingertips. There was nothing unreachable in this gigantic world that we live in. And we were, we all are the same. It doesn't matter under what flag, we're all the same. If you put on that judogi, we are judoka together. Let me introduce myself. I am Jean Kanakogi. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and I'm a former member of the United States judo team. I hold a fifth degree black belt, and I still am a federal law enforcement officer. I've been active in law enforcement for a little over 23 years. I'm a 9-11 first responder, and I have a PhD in psychology. I volunteer as the director of mental health and peer support for the Federal Law Enforcement Officers Association. And I also help Blue Hearts for Heroes that helps law enforcement families with special needs children. But here's a fun fact. I took second place in the Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Contest. So if you learn nothing else, keep your hot dogs away from me. Our website, rustykanakogi.com, is where you can go to get and to order a signed book of this life story. Now, if you don't want to read it, if you see how thick it is, you can actually use it to exercise or use it as self-defense and clobber somebody. We also have t-shirts, so I proudly wear Rusty on my chest over here, an embroidered shirt. Please visit our website, uh, send me an email, tell me what you think. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your attention during my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you find your get up and fight. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Um, I would now like to ask if you have any questions that you'd like to ask, please be sure to enter them in to the, as I mentioned, the Q&A or the chat modules, which if you're on a desktop will be available at the bottom of your Zoom screens. Before we get to any questions, uh, we're now gonna raffle off the two copies of Get Up and Fight that we mentioned uh, at the start. So um, let me just make sure that our winners are present with us still. So our first copy, uh, we'll be going to Clark O'Reilly of our Atlanta branch. So congratulations, Clark. And the second copy is being awarded to Suzanne Purrington. So congratula congratulations both to Clark and Suzanne. Um, and now, if there are any questions, we will get to them. So once again, um, there's none so far, but if you have a question, um, you can go ahead and put them into the chat um, or the Q&A modules on the Zoom screen. And Clark, congratulations. And Suzanne, congratulations. I know you will enjoy this book. Well, there being no questions at this moment, I'm going to turn things over to Executive Director of the English Speaking Union, Karen Karpovich. Karen? Hi, Jean. Thank you again. I, you know, there are few times in life when you really learn something or you're really surprised by something. And this particular event with Jean about her mom was one of the first events that we had done post COVID when we opened the building. And um, I think that in some ways, I think I'm frozen. Oh, in any event, uh, in some ways, it was the perfect entry into our new brave world because I think Rusty would have helped us through what we're all living through, what we had lived through and what we're living through now. And it was such a testament to the strength of women and the power of women and what we're able to overcome. So I hope you did enjoy it. And I do want to thank Jean again for, for, for telling us about an amazing woman who we could all be inspired by and never feel as if we could ever not fight back because we're always fighting back and we continue to need to do that. So I hope you are as inspired and as um, surprised about people and about people's lives and, and about the choices we make and who we meet and who we connect with. So thank you again for being here. Thank you, Jean, for being part of us and our community. Um, I want to thank everybody for being here today and hope that you join us next Wednesday for a little bit different program. Uh, Charles Spencer will be here from our Wrench Speaker Series talking about the white ship, 
which is about the Norman Con Conquest. And then next Friday, if you are a patron member, to join us for our Churchill event, which is going to be our, our Churchill Q&A. And then um, I'm excited to also see that we're going to be doing a Dickens Christmas on December 8th, which should all make us feel very good and very happy. And I think, Josh, we have a question. Did somebody pop up a question? Oh, actually, well, I could. Yeah, yeah there's a question. Go ahead. Yeah. Was Rusty invited to various nations to help women judo get started? Yes. Uh, thank you, Charles, for asking that question. Yes, she was. But, you know, the United States was actually behind. Uh, the Europeans had their stuff together. And even the Pan American Union had a lot of their stuff together. But women's judo needed help in the United States. Now, I have to compliment the current administration of USA Judo because they are huge proponents and advocates for women's judo. And I think Rusty had a lot to do with that. But she was invited into some of the nations you know, on the continent of Africa to help the, the African countries get started in judo. Europe had it together. The Pan American Union had it together. Of course, Asia had it together. But Africa was up and coming. And uh, their fighting spirit was amazing. So she was invited to help other nations go and get their program started. Okay, thank you. Um, and I think we, we got a very interesting, enjoyed presentation very much. I know I did. And um, thank you again, Jean, and a great tribute to your mom. And we all need to be inspired by our moms. So anyway, thanks everybody. And I hope to see you next Wednesday with our presentation from Charles Spencer, which should be really interesting. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye everybody. Thank you.